relevant for the ladies as well, but um, because I am talking on temptation, I confess to you uh, a real area and level of ignorance and how to apply it to the ladies. I am very well acquainted with the battle for men, since I'm in that category, but um, time would not permit me to broaden the target to include the women as well. So however it speaks to you ladies, uh, wonderful. I'm grateful that you are open and willing to apply it. Uh, I, I also believe it is appropriate that I address men mainly because we are more often than not the aggressor and sometimes tragically the predators. And that would include men in ministry. Uh, I realized when I looked at my calendar that this would be my final time to speak for this uh, school year, and I had another direction in mind as I was going to move toward the importance of, uh, especially you who are leaving the school to enter ministry uh, as vocational Christian service in your life, to uh, begin strong and to stay consistent and faithful and to end well. However, um, my direction changed when I received a letter which deserves a little bit of um, preparation so you can appreciate the content of the letter. Uh, I've known the man who wrote this letter since he was a young teenager. He's now in his 40s. Um, I watched him grow up in our church. I uh, found great delight in him and his family. He was often in our home, became our oldest son's good friend, and uh, he as well built a relationship with another young man about their ages, and they were almost inseparable through high school and, and then into and through college. One of the joys of remaining in the same church over a period of years is that you have the chance to go the full cycle. You dedicate them as little babies, and you are a part of the delight of their early years in the elementary school, and and then you uh, teach them, uh, as in our case, uh, in our doctrine class, which we taught them before they entered high school, and you are with them through high school and all of those trials and struggles, and then you're there for them as they marry and as they have their children, which was true of this young man who is uh, now uh, engaged in ministry. He sat where you sit. He attended four years at Dallas Seminary, did very well. And by that, I don't necessarily mean academically. He did very well with his life. And he, with his inseparable friend, just, uh, I think they were probably had most every lunch together. Uh, They found, separate from one another, lovely young women with whom they fell in love, and uh, I married both of them at separate times. So our roots go very deep. So when I get a note from him or a letter, everything stops as I um, read what he has to say. Here are a few excerpts. Your comments on faithfulness and staying at it touched on a tender wound for me. I know you have experienced the heartache of close friends succumbing to moral compromise. Such has been my experience with my best friend since junior high days in Fullerton. He and his wife were struggling with personal intimacy issues in their marriage. And he has had an affair with his church secretary. He has since divorced his wife. She wanted to save their marriage, but he has now married the secretary. He has lost the trust of many believers who look to him as a model of spiritual maturity, the respect of his ministry peers, the loving esteem of his adult children, his ministry credentials removed from him where he has been serving, and so much more, he adds. My wife and I cannot believe what has unfolded in their lives. 
the two of them would have been the last couple. How often I read those words. The two of them would have been the last couple we could have imagined in this scenario. It has moved us to humble praise for God's grace in our lives and a holy assessment of our marriage to ensure that we bring no shame to the name we want to honor. He adds, I read with fresh sensitivity early this morning Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I would love to end this uh, semester message of my time with you on a real high note, and uh, perhaps we can look at it like that. If you will simply promise yourself you'll never forget what I have to say. For however long you live, and without question, you will certainly outlive me and most of us on the platform. And you will carry on. But you must understand that uh, the, the people with whom I spend much of my time professionally are uh, people who have been through this school. These are, these are the men and women that, um, uh, who have paths that cross with mine often. And therefore, I follow their ministries with an enormous interest and uh, devotion and care, and love, and affection. This breaks my heart. I couldn't finish reading it the first time I, I read it. I went downstairs to read it to Cynthia, and I couldn't finish again. Something happened between then and now. Maybe something happened before that I knew nothing about, obviously it did, or I certainly would have addressed it, since we were often together. And I tend not to hold back when I'm really working closely with, with other men. And so today, I am not going to hold back. I'm going to speak forthrightly. I'm, I probably won't need to raise my voice at all, because I think you will listen. Because I think you are also haunted by the same verse that haunts me. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You will never outgrow lust. You will never come to the place where the opposite sex doesn't look attractive to you. Even those you don't even know. It's sort of like what Patrick Morley writes in his book, The Man in the Mirror. The three of us were, were eating deli sandwiches at a street side table on the picturesque main street of town. As we were about to leave, a very lovely woman passed by us on the sidewalk. She was beautiful, fresh sophisticated. She seemed a perfect match for the day. It was a beautiful spring day. Many heads turned as she walked by, including the two men I was with. I watched their eyes follow her, and I could tell they had mentally undressed her in the secrecy of their private thought world. Not a word was spoken, and we headed back to the office. I found myself on the horns of a dilemma. I, I brooded with indignation over the obvious lust of these two, but 
At the same time, I was keenly aware that the only difference between us was that I had more carefully controlled my eye movement. Because Christians are expected not to lust over women. Uh, He's writing to men, so when he says Christian, he means Christian men. Um, I, I carefully concealed my thoughts, yet I knew pretending, yet I knew pretending And yet I knew, pretending not to notice, was counterfeit. I knew I was leading a secret thought life different from the image I projected. I didn't like the pressure of leading those two lives, but I was embarrassed about it. I thought it was exclusively my problem. It never occurred to me that other Christian men might struggle with the same problem. Are you living a secret thought life significantly different from the you known by others? Would you be embarrassed if your friends and associates knew what went on inside your mind? If your thoughts were audible, would your wife want a divorce? Each of us leads a secret thought life an invisible life, known only to us, not known to anyone else. The secret life is usually very different from the visible you. The you that is known by others, yet it's the real you. It's the you known by God. For some of us, our secret thought life consists of a dream world of fantasies which concoct intricate plans that would make us famous or powerful or wealthy. Others of us fabricate chance meetings with beautiful women who seduce us. We each invent a secret image of how we wish we were, which we would be embarrassed for others to know. I have my Bible open to Genesis 39, and uh, as you turn to that chapter, uh, it will be a chapter on sexual temptation. Interestingly, in this case, the woman is the seducer. She is the seductress. That's rare, but that does occur, and maybe some of you ladies have a struggle in this area. I have no way of knowing. I don't understand your world. I do understand the world of men very well, which is why I direct my words mainly today to men. This is a remarkable story of a man who did not fall, who did not even yield. It's a remarkable account of a man who had such possession of his thought life that he wouldn't allow his imagination to run wild. Even though he was a single adult, probably by now in his 20s, maybe late 20s. He has been uh, sold into slavery. He has learned another culture and another language. He now a Jew living among Egyptians and finds himself a trusted servant in the home of a man who was an official of the Egyptian government a man named Potiphar. Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him, I should say bought him, from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Watch closely the setup. His master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight. And he became his personal servant. He made him overseer over his house and all that he owned. 
he put in his charge. What a magnificent trust. This Egyptian officer over time had watched, studied, listened to, seen the results of the work of this Hebrew servant. And little by little, he released to him more and more responsibility and authority and privacy. It came about, verse 5, that from the time he made him overseer in his house over all that he owned. We read again, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. That, men and women, is trust. That's what you earn over the years as a pastor. That is what you earn over the years as a faculty member of some school you may uh, serve. That is the, um, that is the reward of the, our great God on the lives of those who are faithful who do good work, who don't compromise, who tell the truth, who keep their word, who keep short accounts, who don't take advantage of people and don't exploit, who don't manipulate. Joseph was a trustworthy man. And uh, Potiphar finally found himself Completely comfortable leaving everything in Joseph's charge. Before I go one step further, um, I have to pause and say that in itself puts you in a very vulnerable position. Because you still have your thought life. You still have a world that goes on in your brain And in your old nature, that is vile. It is obscene. Which, if the Spirit of God does not control it, waits for the moment to lurch into action. We had a man who was a very fine preacher and a long time uh, uh, servant of Christ. We thought had been in several churches by the time he came to the one he was in when we invited him to be one of our conference speakers. And uh, he, he brought five uh, significant messages, interestingly, on accountability. Only to, for us to find out a few months later that he had women on the string at every church he had served until it finally came to light within months after he had been ministering to us at our conference. And he had lived a lie. Though at each church he had earned the trust of the people by his visible world. But he was a liar. He was an adulterer. He was an unfaithful man. You will be, perhaps, by the grace of God, in a place that will ultimately be enviable. You will have the trust of your congregation. You will have the respect of your elders. You will have the reputation over the years. You will have your degrees. And you will, you will be unquestioned, quite likely, in a setting that becomes a very, very dangerous place. F.B. Meyer, in his book on Joseph, writes, we may expect temptation in days of prosperity and ease, 
rather than in those of privation and toil. Not where men frown, but where they smile. Sweet, exquisite smiles of flattery. It is there. It is there, he repeats, that the temptress lies in wait. If you go armed anywhere, you must, above all, go armed there. I'm reminded of Thomas Carlyle's words, the Scottish essayist. Adversity is hard on a man, but for every 100 who can handle adversity, one can handle prosperity. You are in a dangerous place when all speak well of you. Because then it's you and God. And hopefully a circle of individuals with whom you have made yourself accountable. So that your private world doesn't become a scandal and a shame. So Joseph, we read, is left with everything. The end of verse 6 says something that appears only two other places in all the scriptures. Interestingly, this is said only of David in 1 Samuel 16 and only of Absalom in 2 Samuel 14. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. The NIV says he was well-built and handsome. Nothing wrong with either one. It isn't fair, but there's nothing wrong with either one of them. Nothing wrong with that. We used to have a superintendent in our evangelical free church group out in the west coast a wonderful friend named Wally Norling who referred to one of our younger preachers as being cursed with good looks isn't that a good way to put it if you're cursed with good looks you got even more working against you I've never had that problem thank God I got a bunch of others but that was not one of them but I know some dear guys that are in ministry that uh a woman's eyes roll when he's around. He's just handsome. Joseph was like that. Good shape. Chiseled face. Strong. Young. Available. Mrs. Potiphar noticed it. It came about after these events, isn't the Bible eloquent? How full of meaning are those three words, after these events? Year after year after year after year after year. Faithful, 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 trustworthy, trustworthy, trust. Never once taking as much as a paper clip from Potiphar's house. After these things. The enemy of our souls has perfect timing. Perfect. After these events, his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. That's what I call the direct approach. <laughs> Rarely happens, but sometime it will. I'm drawn not so much to her words, I'm drawn to the word desire. She lusted after Joseph. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has done his best work in a very small book that we could almost call a booklet. It's entitled Temptation. Listen to Bonhoeffer. In our members there is a slumbering inclination toward desire which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. All at once, a secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. It makes no difference whether it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money. Joy in God is extinguished as we seek all our joy in the creature. 
At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. And only desire for the creature is real. Satan, I love this line, Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. We'll just put God aside for now. Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. The lust thus aroused envelops the mind and will in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. That's it. He nails it. In vulnerable moments, I don't hate God. I just kind of get him out of the focus of my mind. Joseph never did that. Mm. Lie with me, she says. But he refused. Good for him. He said to his master's wife, notice how that's, ri- how that's written. He says to his master's wife, of course. Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you were his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Clarence McCartney writes, This was no ordinary temptation. Joseph was not a stone, a mummy, but a red-blooded young man in his 20s. It was not one temptation on one day, but a repeated temptation. An old story tells how when Joseph began to talk about God, the temptress flung her skirt over the marble bust of the God that stood in the chamber and said, now the gods will not see. But Joseph answered, my God sees. Reminds me of what the psalmist writes in 139. Verse 3, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. He knows every minute you spend on the the, uh, internet. He sees everything you look at. He sees every stolen moment. He sees it all. I forget who said it. I wish I had been the originator that a secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. There's no sin here. There's no sin in the temptation. Sin is in the yielding. So he says no. Now, the great hope is that does it. She's out of the way. Nope. Verse 10, it came about as she spoke to Joseph day after day. That he did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Day after day, after day, after day. Remarkable, remarkable relationship with God. I almost said remarkable man, but he's just a man like you or me. The difference is he had cultivated the kind of relationship with his uh, God that would not permit this. Just would not permit it. One day she finally decides enough's enough. It happened on that day that he went into the house to do his 
to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. So they're all alone. I'm sure she made sure there was no one else around, perhaps locked the doors. She caught him by his garments saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Interestingly, so often in the New Testament, when you come to passages dealing with sexual lust, the answer is to run. That's a wonderful response. You can't lust and run fast at the same time. And he took off running, left part of his garments there. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. There's anti-Semitism in her words. This Jew. He came in to me to lie with me and I screamed, so she's claiming rape. Interestingly, if he had meant anything to her, she wouldn't have turned on him. He meant nothing to her. Lust is never a fulfillment of love. It's usually an act of anger and often emotional assault. It goes back to deep, deep, unresolved situations that have not been rooted out, discovered. Came about when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled. She left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom he brought to us came in to make sport of me. It happened as I raised my voice and screamed that he fled. When the master heard of it, his anger burned and verse 20, he put him in jail. Verse 21, but the Lord was with him. How do I apply all of this? Um, Let me do it quickly. Four thoughts came to my mind early this morning. All of them are you must not. First of all, you must not be weakened by your situation. You must not be weakened by your situation. Economically, Joseph was secure, respected, and trusted. Personally, he was handsome, desired. Miscellaneous other things, they were alone, had an excellent track record. He was invited. He was unmarried. It's her idea. Your flesh invariably will remind you of those unique situational circumstances, and you'll fall. If you don't, Strengthen your life in the midst of whatever situation. So you must not be weakened by your situation. Secondly, you must not be deceived in the persuasion. It was a bold, flattering, calculated, direct, and quite frankly, extremely desirable. In what I read, I find that the ancient Egyptian women were fabulously beautiful. It's quite possible that cosmetics began there and they knew how to make themselves even more attractive. He could have thought her husband doesn't meet her needs like I could. By doing this, you'll prove that you really care for me. Who will ever find out we're completely safe? Look, I'm so terribly alone and lonely and God will understand. Just this once, never, ever, ever again. Those are the words of temptation. You must not be deceived in the persuasion. Here's the third, and perhaps I mean this one most uh, firmly of all four. You must not be gentle with your emotions. We read in verse 8, he refused. We read in verse 9, it is a great evil. Those are his words. Sin against God. Those are his words to her. He did not listen to her and would not be with her, verse 10. Verse 12, he left and fled and went into the street. Those are all 
strong, not gentle, but strong reactions to the emotions within him. The late Doug Hammarskjöld once wrote, you cannot play with the animal in you without becoming wholly animal. Play with falsehood without forfeiting your right to truth. Play with cruelty without losing your sensitivity of mind. He who wants to keep his garden tidy doesn't reserve a plot for weeds. You must not be weakened by your situation. You must not be deceived in the persuasion. You must not be gentle with your emotions. By the way, if necessary, be rude. Just be rude. That has a way of turning the other person off. Number four, you must not be confused with the immediate results. Day after day, he's tempted. Advances become more forceful, not less. False accusation followed his obedience. He was later then demoted, misunderstood, and dumped in jail. I would add also, you must never forget the ramifications. In his fine book, Christ and Isaiah, if B. Meyer writes this, this is the bitterest of all to know that suffering need not have been. That it has resulted from indiscretion and inconsistency. That it's the harvest of one's own sowing. That the vulture which feeds on the vitals is a nestling of one's own rearing. Ah me, this is pain. I woke up this morning thinking about my friend's friend in bed with another woman. I thought about how he must feel alienated now from friends and worst of all, his own children. I thought about everything he had planned for and trained for was now worthless. So what does he do now? Is she worth that? If you can possibly project yourself beyond the moment of sheer ecstasy for just a few seconds of ecstasy and think about a lifetime of shame, it'll help you. It'll help. Stay pure. Stay pure. Stay pure. Lord, um, we, we sit in this room and all of it makes such sense. And we would all acknowledge that everything we've heard this ties in with what you have taught and what we believe. And in this room, we're all in the majority and everybody's lockstep with one another. Going to stay pure. Going to stay pure. But in a few years, we'll all be separated and more of our hours will be spent away from anybody in this room. And that's when the test will come. May we never forget the marvelous model of Joseph and the way you strengthened him in this hour, those days, and how you took him even through the jail experience to promote him to a position he would never otherwise have had. I pray for these younger men and women who have their lives before them that they may be for you throughout their lives testimonies of the holiness of God. I ask that for faculty and student alike. 
for preacher and missionary alike, for counselor and staff member and musician alike, for authors and songwriters, for those who hold responsible positions in the future, leading ministries and serving the people. May we be models of purity. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In the name of the Savior, everybody said,